So welcome to uh, the uh, July meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society. Um, what you see uh, up here on the screen is uh, a number of things and uh, we'll probably start at the, uh, the top right. The, uh, the Indian um, lunar mission, uh, Chandrayaan-3, so in other words this is their third, uh, third attempt to uh, go to the moon, has already launched and is on its way. Um, it will arrive at the moon on the 23rd of August and should land. There's a lander on it as well as a rover to go over the uh, lunar surface. And uh, quite amazingly, they put that mission together and built it and got it off the ground within three years. Absolutely amazing. So it's not a manned mission, it's obviously a robotic craft, but nevertheless uh, a wonderful uh, uh, feat to get it done in such a short uh, period of time. And uh, incidentally, it's, uh, it's a woman in charge of uh, that uh, program in India as well, right? So um, known as um, uh, Space Lady, I think they, uh, they call her or something like that. And you see uh, the picture of the lander and, uh, with the rover inside it on the, uh, the top uh, right-hand side of uh, your screen, that uh, yellowy bit there. And... Um, uh, as uh, after it had taken off, it passed over Australia and a lot of people uh, managed to image it and uh, shown uh, with the launch a bit of video there with some of the images that were taken from up in Queensland way uh, in particular. Quite a few uh, members of the public actually managed to photograph it going over and it looked pretty much uh, like a comet in the sky as well. And um, over on the, uh, the top left hand side, uh, you would have heard on the news about the mystery dome that had washed ashore, uh, covered in barnacles, um, just north of uh, Perth. Um, and uh, that's now believed to no longer be a mystery. They, uh, they believe it's uh, part of the uh, Indian Space Agency's third stage uh, rocket booster there of a, a polar satellite that was launched uh, uh, around 2010, 2012 time and uh, it must have uh, come back down to earth and eventually is washed, uh, washed ashore. So you see all the barnacles attached to it, so it's been in the water for quite uh, some time. So uh, no longer uh, a mystery at all. Uh, down in the bottom uh, centre there, we uh, see Phil Peters' first uh, aurora image, which uh, I'll show there, taken from the Briars uh, last month. And um, given that that was a photograph, I suspect uh, it wasn't visible by eye. Monday. Monday, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, and over on the right hand side from, uh, from Chris Costa Canellis, um, at the top there we see a, a blink uh, comparison and I'll, uh, I'll get it blinking. So you see the movement of uh, the comet, Comet C2021T4 is its official name, it's also given another name. And um, if I remember the post correctly, it was about a two hour time gap between uh, those images. Now, something interesting happens with that particular comet if you uh, zoom in and apply a yellow filter and look at the, uh, the bottom, uh, bottom left. We're zooming in on his image here. It turns into a lemon. So they were, it can also be called Comet Lemon. Okay, so with, uh, with tonight, we'll uh, go through events past in the coming month, and I'll throw over to Mark for his uh, Sky for the Month, then over to Astromofo for Chris, and um, uh, there's going to be a, a fight at the front here as to who, who talks with a handheld microphone uh, between Chris, Nerida, Guido, and uh, Dave, and uh, then we'll look at uh, exploring astronomy in space through uh, philately, which uh, is uh, very, very interesting. And then we'll close at the end with another uh, rocket launch, the Euclid mission that went up uh, um, fairly recently to uh, study gravitational, um, uh, so, sorry, dark matter and uh, dark energy by uh, observing uh, and mapping the positions of galaxies out to 10 billion light years away. So they hope to study that uh, indirectly. So that's already successfully on its way, but we'll see the, uh, the launch of that uh, at the end. So recent events since uh, we last met, we had uh, public nights uh, out in Locksport with uh, some of our members uh, went out to far uh, east of Victoria in, into the wilds there and did a couple of uh, viewing nights there. And uh, on the 24th of June, uh, on the second night uh, of those, uh, there was a working bee here at uh, the Briars as well as a talk by uh, Eden to the members who uh, came that Saturday night. 
committee meeting was preoccupied mainly with the big events uh, coming up and obviously tonight's AGM as well. Uh, 6th of July was the uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, so uh, 12 books in as a group. Uh, two others I know of attended independently uh, of the group and one even paid for a VIP package to, uh, to meet uh, deGrasse Tyson as well afterwards. And there probably were other members as well that uh, just haven't uh, come to, uh, to my attention. Uh, the next night was a public night here at the Bras. Unfortunately, it was uh, pretty much uh, wiped out with the cloud, and, uh, but we nevertheless had uh, a pretty good uh, turnout. We were fully booked, but uh, only 65 turned up for that one. And the cosmology meeting was held here on the 15th of July. Coming up is going to be a busy month ahead, as you can see by uh, the number of things on this slide. We've got the working bee this weekend, and as far as I know, the Astronomical Society of Geelong is still coming to visit us here on Saturday. So members are encouraged to come and say hello. This would be, I think, the very first time that Geelong has made the pilgrimage all the way across the, uh, the bay to uh, come and see us as well. So uh, do, do please make uh, an effort to come and say hello to them. There'll be a barbecue on that, that night. Uh, 25th of July, we have a couple of um, scout groups from Hastings and Berwick. Uh, one, one's a guides group, and they're going to be bussing themselves over to the uh, observatory here for um, a viewing night. So we're anticipating a lot of people here. We will probably fill the room here with scouts and uh, guides uh, that night. 26th will be a committee meeting, and 28th will be uh, the general uh, Scout Cubs and Guides Night here at the Bryce. It will be unusual this time in that there will be two talks and two viewing sessions on the one evening. Uh, this, there'll be a 6.30 shift where the Joeys will come in. This is uh, Anders Hamilton's uh, group uh, in Mornington. So all the first session will be the room here full of Joeys. And then at eight o'clock they'll all leave and uh, the regular Scouts and Cubs and Guides will come in for a second session uh, afterwards. 29th, the day after, will be Devon Meadows, uh, the Cubs coming here to the Briars. Public stargazing uh, night uh, um, about a week later. And then uh, looking further ahead down the bottom there in brackets, because it's uh, not before our next meeting, you see the um, astrophotography workshop uh, is nearing capacity. So if you wanted to attend that, you need to book uh, fairly swiftly. Uh, if you leave it more than a week or two, I suspect you're going to be out of luck and um, the, uh, the room will have uh, filled. Um, the Telescope Learning Day, the second for the year, is on the 21st of October and that's already half uh, booked out. So again, if uh, anyone is a beginner and wishes to come and learn the basics of telescopes from scratch, uh, do uh, um, book into that one or at least make it, make it known that you're coming. And lastly, down the bottom, uh, Vastrock, which is uh, down in uh, November. We've already had uh, a few people uh, book, even though we haven't actually advertised it yet. So they did extremely well to, uh, to find the links. Um, I'm, I'm, we're most impressed that, uh, that you found it and successfully booked in. And um, we anticipate uh, somewhere between 90 and 100 people, I would think, uh, for that one. Sky for the month. <laughs> Okay, welcome to uh, Sky for the Month for July 2023. Uh, this will be my final rendition of it. Um, and apparently Guido has put his hand up, so uh, congratulations, Guido. A uh, couple of things, a uh, fairly interesting month coming up uh, over May, June. Uh, do halfway into June because the next meeting's in June. Uh, the next full moon will be on the 2nd of the 8th, and it'll be a super moon. So it basically means the moon is its closest approach to Earth. Uh, at the same time, it's a full moon, so it looks just that little bit bigger. Uh, the new moon occurred uh, last night, so for the next few nights you start to see a sliver. What to look for? Okay, we've already heard mention of Comet Lemon, uh, by name and by nature apparently. And uh, on the 25th of this month, uh, it'll be two degrees northeast of NGC 6397, which is a globular cluster in ARA. Now, if you don't know where ARA is, don't worry, the next slide, I'll show you where it is. <coughs> uh, on the 29th, it's uh, still in ARA and fairly close to the open cluster uh, NGC 6200. 
Coming up, uh, there's actually three meteor showers over the next couple of, well, they're occurring now, their maximums are coming up. One of them is apparently not all that uh, specky, and it'll be fairly low on the horizon, so probably not easily to, uh, easy to watch. But you've got the Salta, Southern Delta Aquarids. It uh, started on the 12th of this month, and will go through till the 23rd of next month. And uh, the maximum is on the 30th, and as is the Alpha Capricornids, also having their maximum on the 30th. I'll have a little bit more about them uh, later in the presentation. Uh, common Panstar, Comet K1 Panstars, as opposed to K2. K2 is still out there, but it's, uh, it's setting just after uh, sunset, so probably uh, not worth chasing it, especially given its 11th magnitude and it's going to be in the twilight, so good luck with that one. Uh, K1 Panstars uh, is very close to uh, Delta Chameleon. That's uh, one of the constellations, and I will show you where that is. Uh, on the 31st of the 7th, and Lemon uh, moves into Scorpio. Now, I'll give you a little bit more information shortly on the comets, uh, where they can be found, because uh, Lemon and one other are uh, in the polar regions, so uh, pretty well in the sky for most of the night. Uh, Mercury will be at greatest elongation uh, on the 10th to the 8th, and uh, the Persage shower uh, will have its max on the 12th of the 8th, so that's the third one and then Venus at inferior conjunction on the 13th of the H, which basically means it will be between Earth and the Sun. So we won't see it, and uh, we're not all on the same plane, so no Venus transit this time, sorry. And uh, they're pretty rare events, uh, for those who've been around for a while. Uh, <laughs> and given that Mercury goes between us and the Sun four times a year, uh, they're even rarer. <coughs> So looking at the, uh, the sky, there's Ara, okay? So this is the sky looking south. So you have your south, uh, south pole here, which in the Briars is out about there. And uh, the chameleon, as I told you, sort of opposite uh, where Octans is. Now the problem with these constellations is the stars are about fifth magnitude. So they're, they're not really easy to spot. So you're really just more looking in the direction of the South Pole. Uh, that's a configuration, July 15, 10 p.m., that's pretty well how the sky looks, and you've got a nice high uh, ecliptic plane at the moment too. That's just one of the benefits of our winter, one of the few benefits of our winter. So, uh, uh, and the reason for that, uh, or beauty of that is it will mean Mercury is actually quite a good view uh, for this evening. Other things you've got at the moment, 47 Takana and Amiga Centauri, which are two fairly bright clusters, although, as some of us already know, Amiga Centauri is not a globular cluster, it's the remnants of a galaxy that hit us years, a few years ago, <laughs> quite a few years ago. So there we all were, sitting terrified, waiting for the Andromeda galaxy to hit us, and we've already been hit, so we survived that, we should survive the next one. Maybe the dinosaurs didn't. You've also got Eta Carina and Tarantula Nebula getting a little bit low down on the horizon, particularly from uh, the briars here. Uh, unless someone wants to get a chainsaw out and take all those trees out, which I don't suggest you do that. Please don't do that. All right, uh, so you do have the two clusters there. Got a little bit of uh, interest up here. You've got, uh, it says the teapot there, that is the central part of uh, Sagittarius. And the teapot, they use the teapot because it makes it very, very easy to find Sagittarius. And the interesting part of that is that's where the centre of the galaxy is, the other side of that. So if you look up there, you can see it's a little bit bright. Put a telescope on there. Good luck picking which individual stars you're looking at because there's so many up there. Looking to uh, the north, we, uh, we still have our ecliptic plane in a fairly good position. Over here we have... Uh, this is basically where the Delta Aquarids will come from, so Aquarius, hence their name, and the Capricornids, well, they're coming out of Capricorn, so there's a little bit of a, a theme to how we select the name of meteor showers. So if you're going to be looking for these, that's your eastern horizon, so you just need to look to the east, out there from here, and 
uh, sort of halfway between the zenith and uh, that. And uh, these showers apparently will be fairly reasonable showers. So uh, certainly one of them has about 25 meteors per hour for its, uh, for its maximum, which is coming up. So probably a good chance if you're looking in that direction, you'll get to see a few meteors a little more later on. Uh, the planets, uh, Mercury began the month in superior conjunction. Superior conjunction means it's in conjunction with the sun, but it's on the other side of the sun to Earth. And uh, as it moves out of conjunction, which it'll do so fairly quickly, uh, it has an orbit uh, period of about 88 days. So it only takes 22 days to get out or go through a quarter of its orbit, and get out towards maximum elongation. Uh, it'll become visible in the evening sky. Now that's a theme for both Venus and Mercury. When they come out of in, uh, superior conjunction, they will be an evening object. When they come out of inferior conjunction, they'll be a morning object. All right, ask me if you really want to know, I can explain it later, but I uh, won't do it here. Uh, now apparently, because of the height of the ecliptic plane, it basically means as the sun goes around, if the Sun wasn't blotting everything out, you would see the orbit of both Mercury and Venus because they go with it. All right, so we're waiting for the Sun to set and we're out here so that we can see them after sunset. Or alternatively, if they're out the other side, you wait for them to pop up before the Sun in the morning. It's chilly Oh, I know you English are bloody comfortable with it, but us Aussies aren't. Okay, so apparently this is going to be a fairly good opportunity to see Mercury because it will be uh, a reasonable distance above the horizon. So look out towards the western horizon, and it's, it is just a faint, uh, a fairly small dot, but it is visible to the naked eye. Alrighty. Uh, Venus, still very bright in the western evening sky. It is getting a little bit lower now. Uh, it reached its brightest uh, on the 8th of the 7th. Now as it approaches us after coming through superior conjunction and it comes round, it tends to put, we, we look more at the back of it. So what you actually will see is like the moon, you'll get gibbous, you'll get half, you'll get crescents. And by the time it gets to that point, its brightest point, it's a combination between the amount of surface still showing that's got sunlight on it and uh, the actual size, because as it approaches, it gets much bigger, which you'll see from the uh, last slide, or third slide. Um, as it moves into inferior conjunction, we're effectively getting a new moon, a new Venus, if you like, we're, because we'd be looking at the back of it, so no surface showing, and also in conjunction with the sun, very hard to pick it out. Uh, at the moment, or about then, it was a quarter crescent, uh, but it's moving into its inferior conjunction on the 13th of the 8th. So the 13th of the next month, we'll, uh, we'll lose Venus from the evening sky, and uh, shortly after, it'll return as a morning object. And uh, Earth, Earth was at Apelion on the 7th of the 7th, uh, at 152,093,258 kilometres. All right, that's just slightly over one astronomical unit, which is 152 million kilometres. Astronomical unit is the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. All right, so it's a little further than that. So uh, that probably explains anyone who understands the inverse square law. That's why it's bloody cold here on Earth at the moment, especially in our hemisphere. Okay, um, we passed the winter solstice, uh, solstice last month. So hopefully those will get a bit longer and a bit warmer. The uh, four outer planets, Mars is, moving, is very low. It's in Leo at the moment, fairly close to uh, uh, Regulus, which is the brightest star in Leo. Uh, it's apparently a red giant as well, but apparently Mars is a bit redder, so it must be having a red contest. Uh, it's not really in the best position to be observed because it's a fair way away. It's only about the quarter of the size of Earth. So it's not a big planet, and it sits right around the back of the sun there. So even though you can still see it, you're not going to get a good view of it uh, or, or any detail. It's hard enough when it's at opposition. 
Uh, Jupiter is still in Aries. Uh, it's still a morning object, rising about 2 a.m. Now that's when it hits the horizon. So for observation purposes, you probably need to give it about an hour for it to get out of the, the thickest part of the atmosphere, be quiet. And uh, <laughs> stop reading ahead. <laughs> okay, so about 3 a.m. Yeah, you can get up about 3 a.m. with the telescope. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. expect to see you there. Yeah, I'll see you there, don't you worry. All right, uh, before you'll be able to see it fairly clearly, uh, give it a few more months, it is heading towards the evening sky. So, uh, once again, we're going to have all the major planets, which means when we go to outreach programs, we're not going to be making up stuff or <laughs> struggling to find stuff to show people. Uh, what you'll notice too with these four outer planets, exclude Mars, because Mars is an every two years object because of the vagaries of its orbit, but the other, the four outer planets are starting to spread a little bit. Uh, the last couple of years have all been in very much the same part of the sky. So at the end of the last half of the year, we've had a real plethora of, of planets to show people, and the rest of it, we're showing them deep sky objects, and they're all going, oh, oh that's nice, where's the planets? So they don't appreciate it when you say come back at 4 a.m. Um, Saturn is now rising about 8.30 p.m., so a respectable time, so about 9.30 you should be able to put a telescope on Saturn. That will be out in the eastern uh, sky. Uh, it will most likely be the brightest object out there, not that it's overly bright, but uh, most telescopes will show you uh, the rings. And an uh, interesting little fact with the rings coming up, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, so the next few months we should start having uh, Saturn for our PVNs, our outreach programs, uh, but please don't put 20 telescopes on one thing. Uh, Uranus, uh, like Jupiter, is currently in Aries. It'll be there till 2025. Now, the reason for this is it's rather pedestrian going around the solar system. It takes 84 years, so it really doesn't travel through much arc uh, in one Earth year. All right, 184th. 360 degrees. So if you want to do a quick calculation, go for it. Uh, so it doesn't go very far, but Jupiter uh, has a, an orbital period of about 12 years, so it travels about 30 degrees of arc every year. So it, it's sort of racing away. Two years ago, it and Saturn were right next to each other. If you look now, there's quite a gap. Even though Saturn has moved, it moves only about 12 degrees a year, uh, Jupiter has sort of raced away from Saturn. So this is why we'll get a bit of a spread of the planets. And Neptune, uh, late evening eastern sky. Oh, sorry, that should be late morning eastern sky. Oh, another cut and paste. Oh, no. uh, in Pisces, it rises about 11.30pm uh, uh, during the mid-month. And I don't care how good your eyes are, it's really only a blue dot in most scopes. Not much detail to be seen. So the appearance of the planets, uh, Mercury, as I said, has just come through superior conjunction because it's on the other side of the sun. If you could see it, we'd be seeing the full face lit. As it moves out, you start getting this little bit of shadow like the moon. And the interesting thing is the shadow is on the same size of both Mercury and Venus. And that's because they're both evening objects. They're both in the, uh, the eastern part of the sun. Uh, Venus, we're looking at a fair bit of the back of Venus now. All right, as it moves in between us and the sun, all you get to see is this little uh, crescent here. Can be helpful with Venus because Venus is pretty bright and it flares in most scopes and uh, that sort of stuff. So fairly high magnitude and relatively large to all the other planets. Mars, just a little red dot. Not much to be seen there. You'd be very lucky to, uh, to see any detail on it. And uh, now we get to Saturn. You'll notice the rings are a lot narrower. Now, what is happening is as we go around each of our years, next, uh, sorry, in 2025, I think March 2025, we're going to pass through what's known as Saturn's ring plane. And so that will mean the rings will be edge on to us. And that's because Saturn is inclined to 27 degrees to the ecliptic. Like every gyroscope, it goes around the sun like that. So there are two times in its 30-year orbit that the rings are side on to the sun. And as we go between, 
we lose sight of them. So what will happen is if Saturn does this, looking at the bottom of the rings, then looking at the top of the rings, looking at the bottom of the rings, then the top of the rings, and so on. So for those who were here who looked at this last year, the rings were quite wide, but now they're starting to narrow, and that's that as we approach that ring plane. Jupiter uh, always puts on a very good show, hitting its four moons. Uh, always worth having a look at if uh, you're happy getting up about 3 a.m. Or staying up. Some people, that's, a, that's just a late night. Other people, it's an early morning. And Uranus and uh, Neptune, there's not a lot of detail on Uranus anyway. It's just a blue-green disc. Uh, most people just want to look at it so they can say they've seen Uranus through a telescope. And uh, Neptune, well, yeah, if you can pick up the blue in the, the dot, uh, good luck. Uh, other stuff. There's a few comets running around at the moment. Uh, I've left K, Panstars K2 out because it's setting just uh, almost immediately after sunset. Uh, comet V2ZTF, not to be confused with the Green Goblin Comet, which is uh, way off on its 57 year tour of the solar system. Uh, is in Aries about 10th magnitude. So it rises just after midnight in the east uh, and it will finish the month in Cetus, the whale. Okay, so the, uh, the east, out to the side here, uh, obviously going to change when you're at home. Comet Panstars K1 is currently in Octans. Now Octans is right next to the South Celestial Pole. Don't expect to really see much there because it's fifth magnitude stars and uh, used to align telescopes for those that are diehards. <laughs> and uh, it will move into the chameleon uh, at about 11th magnitude. Now the chameleon is the, virtually the other side of the South Pole to octans. Okay, we can go back to the, uh, that one there. So there's octans, the South Celestial Pole, and here's the chameleon. So that, that one, it's, it's running around the South Pole here at the moment, but is 11th magnitude, so definitely a telescope object. Uh, comet Lemon, uh, currently 9th magnitude, which is quite bright for a comet. Uh, Chris photographed it the other night, so those of you who saw it on Facebook, uh, it's obviously reasonably easy to find, take it. Could you visually observe it or did you just... You just did the camera? Yep, no worries. Ninth magnitude is sort of getting to pushing the, even the limits of most scopes. You'll see it just as a fuzzy little ball at the best. All right. Um, it's moved into telescopium, and then on the, into Ara on the 24th, Scorpius on the 30th, and finally Norma on the 31st. Everyone's going, where the heck is that? So, it's kind of going to do a, a yo-yo. So, uh, Telescopium moves into Ara, up into Scorpius, and then down into Norma. So it's okay. In terms of finding it, the real easy way to find it is obviously Sagittarius uh, and Scorpius. Okay, two fairly easy constellations to find. And it's going to be just below them in the direction of the South Pole. So Scorpius and it's going to be just in that area below, and depending on when you're looking for it, it is yo-yoing between those four constellations. And the last one, Comet uh, Linear, is in Aquila at around 11th magnitude. It's a, it's a morning one, so given we've got pretty good night ones, I probably wouldn't worry too much about that, unless you really want to see Comet Linear. Uh, it essentially uh, rises in the east, but it stays fairly well in the northern uh, sky for most of the month and not very high above the horizon. Not a good place for, from the briars because of the lights of Melbourne. The other stuff, uh, two meteor showers in particular of note, the uh, southern delta Aquarids, one of the strongest showers and running from the 12th to the 23rd of the 8th. So it's in progress now. So if you went out and had a look there, you might, uh, might be lucky to pick a few up. And on the 30th of this month, uh, it'll have its maximum uh, performance with about 25 meteors per hour. So I, I reckon a blind man could almost see one. 
and the Alpha Cap Recordings. Uh, known for bright slow meteors with long paths and a few fireballs. So they're the ones that sort of go right across the sky. Alrighty. So uh, I'd love to see one of them. Uh, seen from the 3rd of the 7th to the 15th of the 8th with their maximum also on the 30th. Now they're in about the same part. They're just, just going to be above the eastern horizon there, out in that direction in Capricornus and Aquarius. So you're not going to have to strain yourself. You just sort of stand there and look in that direction. And uh, I guarantee most of them will happen as soon as you turn your back. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> Upcoming events, Members Barbecue and Working Bee on Saturday the 22nd starting at 4pm. Working Bee uh, includes a general tidy up of the premises followed by the Members Barbecue. More hands the merrier. And uh, it also includes uh, this time a couple of members from the Astro Society of Geelong, as Nerida mentioned early, uh, will be visiting. So a uh, good opportunity to do a bit of networking, get to meet some people over the other side of the bay there. Uh, Scouts, Cubs and Guides Nights, there's several coming up there. Uh, Tuesday the 25th starting at 7pm. Friday's two sessions, you've got the Joeys at uh, 6.30 is it? Oh sorry, okay, I thought it was, I got off Nerida's email. So 6pm and 8pm and then on Saturday starting at 7pm. Members wishing to assist with Scout, Cub, etc. nights, school nights and that sort of stuff will need a current Working With Children certificate. Information tonight provided by Astronomy 2023, Wallace Dawes at Northfield. Any questions? Okay, uh, welcome to our latest um, AstroMofo. Uh, now the last one we did was um, globular clusters which we dragged over two months because of um, dodgy weather. Uh, and uh, we did have a flurry of photos come in over the past week actually when we had a few clear nights, everyone got out, took some photos and we managed to get a few of them in. So um, yeah, the weather's finally helping us. I think it was because I'd mentioned the clouds last time. They moved away we got some photos so this one here was um what do we got here we've got uh, m22 in sagittarius which i managed to grab with my refractor um and people who finished who did got the challenge in this uh this time were greg walton kelly clitheroe from uh geelong yes who's also an empath member guido tack phil peters and myself so this image uh was by Kelly and she's given us an example of what isn't a globular cluster. So this is um, Omega Centauri at which we mentioned is a nuclear star cluster. Uh, the remnant of an old uh, galaxy which uh, interacted with the Milky Way and lost its outer stars and that's the remnant core of uh, that galaxy. So globular clusters are generally formed from the collapse of a huge massive molecular cloud which uh, generally collapses uh, usually these things are about 10,000 or more solar masses and you get a burst of star formation happening all at once. So these, uh, these things generally, the stars in them are all generally the same age, formed at the same time. Uh, they do sometimes have two generations of stars. I don't really know why that happens. It could be because of interactions with other gases happen during its life and trigger another star formation. But very interesting things which we'll learn more about, I'm sure, at um, Vastrock. So this is uh, Guido's photo of NGC 104 or 47 Takana as we more commonly know it and we've got the um, small Magellanic cloud there in a mosaic of four frames with the ASI air, yep, um, uh, using his William Optics telescope. Uh, next we've got a few photos by Greg which he took down here at the observatory last night or the night before? Monday, Monday night. Um, so we've got some photos from the Mead and we've got the, um, uh, what have we got, M4 uh, near Antares and M5 in Serpens there by Greg from the, the Mead telescope as well as, uh, what have we got, NGC 104, um, uh, NGC 6528 and 6522 over there and also uh, NGC 5139. So these are in, uh, what have we got, in Omega Centaurus in the bottom there is um, not a globular cluster uh, in Centaurus, which we all know where that is, near, just off the Southern Cross. 
6522 and 6528 are in Sagittarius. Uh, and 65222 is possibly the oldest globular cluster in the Milky Way. Uh, it's thought to be more than 12 billion years old. So one of the older ones. Uh, and they're in a region of the sky near um, uh, Sagittarius, the teapot. So if you get the spout of the teapot, uh, that part of Sagittarius is called Bard's window, I think it is, B-A-A-D-E-S window, which is a part of Sagittarius, part of the sky looking towards the core of the Milky Way, which between us and the core is fairly devoid of uh, molecular gas and dust. So it gives us a nice clear view of that part of the Milky Way. And if you have a look at it, you'll notice that there's, there is a patch there that shines a bit brighter than the rest of it. And that's, uh, that region is called uh, Bard's Window. And it's just at the spout of the teapot of uh, Sagittarius. Um, uh, what else we got? A few more by Greg. Um, we've got uh, clockwise from the top, M55 in Sagittarius, um, which is probably the closest uh, globular cluster to us at around about 17,000 light years. NGC 6723, also in Sagittarius and um, uh, right next to, Co uh, uh, yeah, in Sagittarius, right next to the border of Corona Borealis actually, and M28 uh, also in Sagittarius. So uh, Greg pretty much takes his photos, ISO 6400, 30 exposures, 30 seconds, and works really well to get some pretty reliable photos. So if you're starting out, 30 seconds, 30 exposures, ISO 6400. Um, and also a couple more by Greg. Uh, these were with the 350 Mead, and um, we've got M22 and uh, NGC 6441, which is in the tail of Scorpio. Got a lot of clusters. Phil got these ones. Uh, cluster of clusters. 47 Takana, M4, Omega Centauri, not a cluster, and, or globular cluster, and uh, M22. So um, 47 Takana, we know where that is, up near the small Magellanic Cloud. M22 in Sagittarius, M4 in Scorpio, and Omega Centauri in Centaurus. Uh, these are a couple that I got. Um, which is, uh, what have we got, M4 in Scorpio with the, that oh, doesn't really show up too well on that screen. There's a bit of nebulosity around here, around that star, which is um, Alniat. Shows up better on my screen. Um, but uh, that's a pretty interesting part of the sky. If you ever get a wide field view of that part of the sky, you've got the globular cluster, you've got that bit of nebulosity, you've got Antares next to it, and it's a really interesting part of the sky. Um, uh, M9 in, uh, the other one is M9 on the right. We've got two globular clusters in that photo. One on the right, which is M9, and the other one on the left, which is a smaller one in, um, uh, they're in Ophiuchus. Um, okay, and they're all with my 90, 80mm refractor and um, ASCII camera. And the next one uh, is globular, uh, what have we got? Uh, planetary nebulas. So Greg put an article in the, uh, Scorpius magazine in the last issue of um, planetary nebulas of where to find them, what they are, and um, whereabouts they are in the sky. So uh, have a look at the news uh, newsletter article, and you'll see where you can find all these and try and get some um, try and get some photos of them. Um, so that'll be. It. You've got to be quick though. These only last about ten thousand years before they dissipate. So get your photos in quickly. Any questions? So uh, May, May, what were the dates? Mid-May. Um, <laughs> Mid-May, there was a South Pacific Star Party in Ilford in New South Wales, and um, uh, several members decided we'd um, have a crack and go down there. Uh, there was a few more of us that were originally going to go, but um, life and conditions took their toll, and uh, we missed a few members. So in the end, it was Dave, myself, Guido, and Nerida who... Uh, packed our cars and decided to head off and make the trek. Oh, there you go. That was my first time. First, first, there you go. Dave's a, Dave's a veteran of it, so Dave knows all about it. So it was around about how many kilometres? 800 kilometres up, 800 kilometres back, but I think that's our first day. Felt like a long drive. Um, 
So our first day, eight hours of driving, and we ended up, we all, uh, we all ended up at parks. I think Guido and Dave left a bit earlier with their caravans, and me and Nerida slept in and got up at a lazy 5 a.m. before we headed off. Um, and somehow we all ended up at parks within about a half an hour, an hour of each other. So I was yeah. well organized in the end. There's my bonnet. Dave, sunrise. And the sunrise. So that was, I don't know, 7.30 or something in the morning. I think I just put on the Monash there. Oh, the, um, oh, yeah. oh, they're driving along there. Um, there's a bit of a traffic jam there. We obviously uh, struck some uh, uh, farmer moving cattle down the road. <laughs> Uh, first night at um, the caravan park in Parks, we uh, caught some of the cattle. Yeah, that's. Uh, that's the, that was a couple of the cows on the road we picked up. So yeah, just a few drinks to uh, to relax after the first day's driving. That's a long day. That's a long day. Yeah, long day drive. So, Parks. The next, so the next morning, yeah, we uh, headed up to the Parks Radio Telescope um, and uh, we had a bit of a tour around there. Uh, had a bit of a look at a 3D display that, um, that they offer, which uh, is a 3D film of the uh, Milky Way and the solar system and that sort of thing, which was fairly interesting. What else was there on that? Also tour of the telescope, like 3D tour. Oh, that's right, yep. 3D tour of the telescope and um, they also had some interactive displays in the... Uh, in the foyer there as well um, and uh, there we go there's the four of us standing in front of the telescope and that looks familiar <laughs> this was a hyperlapse my phone did of about I stood there quite shaky for about ten, oh, five minutes and then it sped it all up to ten seconds so you can actually see it's been I'm down now. Uh, they let us in the control centre. <laughs> I think that's a that's an old mock up of um, one of the old control centre there. When it was the Apollo era, so that was the control centre used to control the pointing of the dish. This was from the movie. Sorry. This was from the movie Apollo 13. This was? Yeah. Oh, is that the set? Yeah. This was actually when they um, filmed the movie at the dish and they let the parks centre keep the props that they had used in the movie. And so they have that set up in the foyer there. Yeah. Sundial. Sundial. <laughs> Sundial. Uh, dish, mini dish, map. Okay. So our uh, next part of the trip was over to Bathurst. So a couple of hours drive after parks, Bathurst, and then onwards to, um, to Ilford. And uh, this, is, uh, this is not sped up. This is Nerida going around Mount Panorama. <laughs> and it's not, not, not quite as fast as she drives on the freeway. She was slowing down a little bit here, but um, it was yeah. Hard, I had to hold my phone with one hand while I was driving with the other hand. So as I turned corners, my phone turned corners as well. So that's why it looks so dodgy. Oh, hang on. This was the... Uh, the best burgers in Bathurst. So, of course, I'm not thinking too Sorry. It was okay. It was the best burger in Bathurst I've ever had. So there's the, uh, um, I'll go back one slide, Nero, don't you missed it there. So there's a, we start at the back of the site, so we're in a site about a similar size to LMDS in, at Heathcote. Um, it's a big, long, skinny property, um, and right at the back there's an old house they dropped there, and that's sort of where the uh, astrophotography people go up the back. They're a little bit less stringent on the lights. Um, there's also, you can run generators and so on up the back, which sort of suits um, <clears throat> my style of imaging. And um, down the front there, everything's on solar and, and batteries. So uh, we're stuck up the back. There's a bit of a pathway there. It's probably oh, about a 
kilometre walk. Uh, less. Maybe eight hundred metres. metres. Seems like a long way at night time. <laughs> so let's track. There's our little setup. So yeah, I'll go back there. We got that's my van, which was the first trip, big trip for my van. I might set up out to the side there. It looks like I'm still getting it ready. There we go. That was a mobile command center. Mobile command center. And then we got the uh, narrator set up there, which was the first time with that tent, was it? That wasn't in my backyard, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Chris. Chris is set up there. Um, and uh, Guido had... Have you got your real camper yet? No. Nope, yet. So this was the same as what he's going to get us on order. So his camper trailer set up. It gets cold. If you're ever planning on going to one of these things, um, prepare for the cold. Yeah, it was minus two in the mornings and overnight. You need dew heaters on your equipment. Uh, and there was frost on the tents in the morning, frost on all the, all, anything that you leave out gets frost on it. So uh, you've got to make sure that if you're going to these things, get plenty of layers, get your thermals, get gloves, get jackets, get everything. So, um, and make sure you've got a good size sleeping bag that you're not hanging out of like I was so uh, yeah it does get cold that's on my roof yep but we did get uh, when we were there we got some really good nights the first night we were there Thursday night uh, yeah th uh, fr Thursday night and Friday night yeah Thursday night and Friday night were spectacular nights we had beautiful days like this and clear nights and the view of the sky was just really spectacular so it's, it's a really good dark dark sky site um, and um, yeah really spectacular views and this is the main observing field um, down there yeah so they got a, a field in the bottom there a little bit different than those who are familiar with Heathcote is members up there can actually build an observatory up there like a solar powered off-grid observatory some of these are actually remotely controlled so they've actually got these on the site um, it's a good idea, good setup if they got the land. I think there's probably about 20 of them scattered around in the area there. Um, some of them just use them. There's like a the guy standing in front of one. He obviously just rolls that back. Some of the other... Oh, sorry, Keto wasn't. Um, up the back there, those two up there, they're both remotely controlled, so they can completely operate that from the guy that runs that was in Sydney. So that's a good little setup. There's Imaging Alley. That's sort of... What they call that little strip there um, everyone up there is pretty much doing astrophotography once again a little bit more lenient on the stray light um, they've actually got some light policies there so um, when you pull up and you want to put your car on the field you actually have to sort of show them that you can open the door and the light doesn't come on so you're going to pull the fuses that is quite militant um, and that there for the uh, everyone's enjoyment that's the battery charging station I took a photo of so during the day there's a big generator it runs up near the uh, front office and um, uh, the back of the shed and people can bring up their batteries and charge uh, uh, yeah I took this one this was um, a refractor that they had a uh, beta wedge on uh, with bino viewers and they were looking at the Sun uh, so there was a green filter on it but um, managed to get a bit I don't know if the bino viewers do much for viewing of the sun but it was still spectacular looking at it through that sort of a size telescope you're actually able to scan across the surface of the sun and have a look at different different features on it I think it would have probably would have been better without the bino viewers but it was um, it was still a pretty spectacular view those were the guys from Testa by the way that had that set up Testa optics and um, who we met um, what's his name the owner of Testa optics the Italian guy Guy. Yeah, yep. cool <laughs> nice guy. Yeah. You'll never forget him. Walk oh. Oh. That's our walk. So it's about 10, 15 minute walk from the back up to the front. So we got used so to that truck. This is from your campsite yeah. To, to, yeah. to the main campsite. To the main campsite. So you. So what, what it is where the main where the main observing field is is pretty much where you when you first come into the area and they've got their sheds they've got um, areas there which are under cover and fireplaces cooking areas 
toilets, showers, all of that sort of stuff set up there. That's in the main part of the, the, the field. Uh, and then where we were, up the back where uh, the Barry Gertie, it's called the Barry Gertie's Lodge. Um, uh, that's, you go up that track and you get, still on the same property, but you go up the track and that's at the back of the property. Uh, so they're a little bit more lenient with um, their light policy, as Dave was saying. And, and generators, we're able to have, uh, Dave was able to have his generator going, so we're all able to plug into that and, um, and run off that. And um, what about, like, three or four hundred people? go to this event, so it's quite big. In the past I've had 450 is the biggest they've had. But that's 450 amateur astronomers. It's not public, so that's, that's quite a, a good concentration of, um, of, of, of people that go there. And all over Australia they come from. And overseas, yeah. it's at the same time as the Texas Star Party. So in the earlier days, pre-COVID, quite often some people from the Texas Star Party would come over here and some people go over there. They actually set up um, a system. You can actually ship some gear, and then organisers would receive it. So you go over there, get your telescope, you know, from DHL, use it for the star party, then get it shipped back. So they had a bit of a arrangement there for some of their members, which is a pretty cool idea, really. So uh, my imaging rig, that's my cable management, and that's my excellent cable management. <laughs> Uh, that's my one with my excellent cable management. Um, I think me and Dave both had a few problems with our setups on the first night. Guido got it going straight away. Um, but I had driver issues, Dave had wiring issues and driver issues. and So we managed to get that fixed for the second night though. But um, yeah, the first night was a bit of a mess. So there's... I took my bono viewers up there, so we all got a picture in front of them, which is really good on the skies up there. They're already flicking through pretty quick. Well, there's not much to say. It's <laughs> You, you can tell the, the light policy at this part of the camp is pretty slack because we were light, light painting all of these <laughs> photos. So there was no, no uh, police coming around, you know, light police coming around. The imaging is not as, not as critical, so no one's really at the back to it visual. Is it time lapse? This was, no, this was just a picture taken with my phone, with my phone lent up against my drink bottle behind my tent, so that's my tent at the bottom, and that was a 30 second shot, because it was stuck so dark there, it, um, that's unedited, it's just how my phone took the picture. And there's Bud's window. <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite a picture. Uh, this is my time lapse, so I'd set up my camera to take a bit of a time lapse, but um, I didn't have a dew heater, so I on the camera so it's not very long but um yeah it went for a while it would have been good to have got it a bit longer because um it was really nice sky uh there's a, there's a few photos that i took the, of uh, dark nebulas i thought i'd take the opportunity not to use any filters and just use um uh just the the, the plane the camera on its own um just because the skies were so clear so that's that's called the little snake that um little black nebula there and that's in amongst the star fields of uh, Sagittarius there. This one's called the parrot head and the parrot is actually up in the top. Can you see it? Little parrot head, the black parrot head up there. And the other one is just called some obscure number, but that's the, that's the, um, oh, what's that cluster called? Um, Ptolemy cluster, I think. I think it's called the Ptolemy cluster down that one there. M7, yeah. That's down the bottom in that. Oh, no, that's all right. And the last one was um, the Swan Nebula, which I took, managed to get some uh, decent photos of on the last night. But that's on the last night on um, Friday, not the last night, Friday night, uh, started imaging and I had a plan to get a nice mosaic around this with my new ASI Uh But yeah, it's clouded over halfway through imaging this and that's the last images that I managed to ca get. Now here's my time lapse. I put a heater on it, so it got most of the night. It did go through a 30 amp hour battery just running the heater for the night. That's how cold it got. So I think it went pretty much all night. So that's with the uh, the Pentax K1 with the. 
14 mil Samyang lens on it, looking pretty much straight up. Oh, the, with the, with my one though, if you go back to the the other one, the time lapse, you can see because this is looking uh, directly east, and the, you can see the glow behind the trees in the sky. So you do even get some glow from Sydney and um, Newcastle, I think that is. Uh, the guys were mentioned talking about it on the field uh, that you wouldn't get that glow uh, maybe five or eight years ago, but there is increasing glow coming from the cities even out there, and we're about four hours from Sydney. Four hours from Sydney, so yeah, the light pollution really is creeping up. Oh, that's my. Oh, this is. Uh, there was a photo competition. And uh, there was one photo of Earth from space uh, submitted by a flat earther, so we've... <laughs> it didn't win. <laughs> and this was on Saturday, Saturday, like Saturday, Saturday. Or Saturday. yeah, Saturday. Yeah, so Saturday the weather turned wet and um, fires got going and it was, uh, yeah, days to stay in and not do much. Yeah, that's, it. that's in the main camp, yeah. I think there was a couple of fireplaces, wasn't there? there was, so there was, there was a couple of structures with fireplaces that you could go and sit around and chat to people and drink whiskey and... Here we go, so the last day, because the clouds come in, as you can see there, we decided to put an antenna up and... As you do. As you do, when you go. And there we go, we got the antenna up there and just tuning it up. And here's Guido, first contact. So yeah, I made my, my first contact on Guido amateur got radio. His license, so congratulations <laughs> to Guido VK3 ODG. Yeah, that's um, right. And that was his first call. So uh, he did that uh, as a portable up there, and it just uh, it was raining. So we all retreated inside the van, and because I had a generator, I had the heater running too. So <laughs> that worked pretty well. Right, and um, then we packed up on the Sunday, I guess? I, I think on Sunday night, as most of us did. Yeah, yeah. So but, we, yeah. but we... Yeah, but we basically um, left early on Sunday and then drove to um, Canberra, so we didn't drive straight back home, um, and had a look at Mount Stromlo Observatory. So um, Nerida managed to organize a tour for us, and uh, these are a few of the pictures from what it looked like before they had the massive fires go through. So unfortunately, it's all burnt out now. So you can still see um, the massive dome they have there. And I think this used to be the like two and a half meter um, reflector that they had there. Yes. Yeah, the 70 inch exactly. Um, so it's 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 a really really sad story <laughs> if you if you look at it. That's it's it's a massive facility, and, and obviously. Um, there's still lots of equipment in there. They haven't really cleaned that up. And this was 20 years ago. Still due to money and I believe asbestos and stuff in there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But we we managed to have a look at the. I think this is the the director's house or something like that. Director's. Uh, I don't know. Um, and that's still run by the ANU. So the university still has their um, astronomy and astrophysics section up there on Mont, Mont Stromlo. We've got a private tour. I think this is one of the old um, solar observatories. Um, and this is a fragment of the Henbury meteorite. And um, Maddie, who gave us the tour there, told us that it has basically a built-in um, uh, theft prevention mechanism, which is just that it's a bit heavy. So I think the next, <laughs> so it's it, it's on a chain, but <laughs> it doesn't really have to be. <laughs> now, 250 it, it kilos. has been picked up by an amateur. So Mike Sedonio, who's actually doing the talk this Saturday down at the photo judging competition that um, they were talking about uh, last meeting, he's actually picked this up and carried it around the room. I did actually invite Mike to come along tonight to say hello because he's down in Melbourne for this event, but he's not arriving to Melbourne till tomorrow morning. So I've invited him up here Friday night, and if he says yes or something, I'll uh, let people know because yeah, yeah, so he was actually uh, <laughs> when you actually see Strongman Mike, he is um, he's the keynote speaker at that Australian Photography Awards. Um, he's a good friend of Steve and myself. He goes to the South Pacific regularly as well. Did you get the other shot where I picked it up? <laughs> yeah. No, the camera didn't work for that shot. Oh, we missed it. And so apparently the students um, are having, having a competition once a year or something to try and pick it up with a few people. And um, they managed to lift it a centimeter off the thing, but that's you can it. You see all the scratches. 
Yeah, exactly. So that's the glass top basically scratched from, yeah. Um, and then they have a nice display of some old, I, I'm not even sure what this was, I think. I don't know, I think just the this is engineering students just put stuff together yeah. as a bit of fun. I think those were telescopes that were down at Antarctica for a while. And they ah, that's right, yeah. And then they just have them on display there. But the robot man is just something that the engineering students there put together for a bit of fun. During the ah, that's, <laughs> that's called Possum Hall. Yeah. I think the, uh, that room where, where we were in where all those displays are is called Possum Hall. And the reason it's called Possum Hall is when they first laid the concrete foundations for it, they did the fresh concrete and they came back the next day and they found these possum prints in the fresh concrete. So they decided to call it Possum Hall. Right, so this, this is inside, or you, you can actually see this from, um, from the kind of visitor part, but we got access to the ground floor there, which was really, really fantastic. So this is the Wombat. So it's a, I think it's just a vacuum chamber um, that you can use for testing satellites and stuff like that. And, it's a heating and so it, it does the heating, the heating and um, so the thermal environment and the vacuum of space to, to simulate that and, and test satellites. And I think they, they told us that they had a massive grant to put it in and then it was used a couple of times, but basically um, it's just sitting there now for, <laughs> for tourists to look at. Um, and then they led us into the optics um, lab so that was really interesting where they um, just basically build um, their optical instruments. So very cool to see. So some optical benches <clears throat> where they had some test equipment set up and a, a nice mix of kind of um, things that they designed and made and some kind of off the shelf components put together. Um, yeah, it was, was really cool to talk to people there. Lots of, lots of kangaroos. And you can see the small domes there. Um, so they are not part of a, um, um, like a research observatory there. They're used, um, they're, they're basically, um, they've got some nice telescopes in there that they use for public events and things like that. So um, they're running public nights. Nice. That's, that's Maddie actually who gave the tour for us and who's going to speak at Bastrock this year um, about globular clusters and things that are not globular clusters. So um, that's going to be really interesting. And this is, yeah, exactly. So they've, they've got a mead um, in there as well uh, on a fork mount um, and the, I think the dome is fully motorized, so you can actually remote control, or not remote control, but you can control the dome. And they run um, public nights with, I think, like a dozen people or so in the dome. So it's a, it's a pretty large dome compared to ours. It's probably a nice thing. That's that's the big dome with the 70 inch. Um, yeah. Right, and that is uh, the tip in Billa. That's, that's coming. So. So this was in the afternoon and then um, we thought we've got about um, an hour or so till sunset. So we went down to Titman Villa, the NASA tracking station that's actually quite close to, um, to Mount Stromlo. So we drove down there, um, had, took some nice pictures uh, at sunset of the um, big dishes around there. So the visitor center there is currently closed so we couldn't actually get a tour or go into the visitor center, but at least took some nice, um, nice shots. Yeah, and we and <laughs> Dave's team, <laughs> and then we went back up to um, Mount Stromlo and um, saw. Got past security. Got past security. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit dodgy. They don't <laughs> usually let people in after dark, but if you know the secret, um, the secret password, the secret password <laughs> they they let you back in. Um, and then we just walked around. It was freezing cold. It was I think minus five that night, um, and. And this one is taken, yeah, may, do you want to take that? <laughs> this one is taken with Nara's phone. <laughs> and these are basically satellite tracking stations. So they, they shoot lasers at satellites to measure um, their orbits. Um, and um, so you could actually see the, the green lasers were, were visible. So it's actually quite fun to, to see that at night. Yeah, and some of the burnt out ruins from um, um, the, the previous telescope domes. The, um, the Great Melbourne Telescope also used to be housed in one of those, but um, I think that one was removed just before the fire. So it this, this one had the Yale Columbia Telescope in it, oh, right. yeah. and which is the photo that we saw at the start with the first uh, photo, the old photo of the big telescope that used to be housed in, uh, in this observatory. Yeah. It was it was a be really beautiful night and um, and very very cold. So the <laughs> the Great Melbourne Telescope was there for the fire and was there for about four or five years after we did 
Ah, so was the. Ah, so um, but, but it, uh, yeah, yeah. So. It was along further, more between, you know, that shell just before the main building. That's where it was in, I believe. Yeah. Mike Harbour's part. Yeah, yeah. There's. Yeah. Yeah, but they they still have the round um, like just the, the walls of the observatory building, but um, none none of the insides. Yeah, and then we drove home um, and stopped. Well, that was <laughs> that was Monday morning in Canberra. Yeah. <laughs> There's a submarine station in Holbrook, New South Wales, which is around about 400 kilometres inland. So I don't know how they get the subs in and out of there, but um, oh, this part of the sub is called the Duck's Ass. they call it, uh, lovely, lovingly called the Duck's Ass by submariners. Um, it's the stern of the submarine, so I thought that was a funny one to take. Um, and yeah, they've uh, put a submarine there. In the middle of the park. You can actually, yeah, you can actually look inside. It's just the top part of the submarine. It's not the whole thing. It hasn't floated up or anything. They've they just put the top part. They couldn't afford the whole thing, so they, 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 they collected money to, to buy the submarine. They, they only got enough to pay for the top half. And so that's why. <laughs> Who's got the bottom half? Um, and we had uh, lunch at the Edamoga pub as well, so we stopped in there and um, uh, had a bit of a bite to eat and had a bit of a look at the fun stuff they've got around there. And that was it. Great trip. Highly recommend it. If you get a chance to go to one, you should go to one if you haven't already been. Next year, so I usually go, so just send a message to the group if you're interested or... There is the, the next one coming up is um, uh, Vic, South. Vic South in um, in the Wimmera, in Little Desert. So uh, there's a few members that are interested in going to there that have uh, booked it. So if you are interested in uh, joining us um, at the in the Little Desert, um, yeah, you can. Yeah, it's much closer. In November, right? And probably not as cold. Yeah. Yeah. So you, sorry. Which would deduce uh, South Australia border? It's hang on, is it Little Desert? Nil. It's no, Nil. It's near Nil. It's near Nil, Fred. Not yes, not yes. Wimmera. It's not Wimmera, is it? No, sorry. Near Nil. Nil halfway between Melbourne and Adelaide. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, if you are interested, uh, book a ticket and um, we can get a bigger impasse delegation going. Yeah. All right. Any other questions on that? Yep. Are they? Did you see a petrol pump very close to those that survived the fires in 2003 that wasn't even blackened? The fire was all really? Meters are all around it. Okay. Well, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining me this evening. As you know, my name is Catherine, and tonight I will discuss what we can learn about astronomy through philately. And I will show you some examples of what stamps exist globally celebrating the subject of astronomy. And here we have a perfect example of an astronomy themed stamp. Um, it was issued by the United States Postal Service in 2017 to celebrate the total solar eclipse that was seen in the United States. And it was the first total solar eclipse seen along a very narrow path across the US since 1918. It's actually one stamp, but the design is made of thermochromic ink, which means that when heat is applied, the colour changes. So you can see here on the left hand side, the moon is obscuring the sun and you can see the sun's corona around the edges, um, which is the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere. And when heat is applied to the stamp by pressing a thumb or finger on it, the full moon appears, which you can see here on the right hand side. And this is actually a real photograph of a total solar eclipse taken in Libya in 2006. So the world of stamp collecting is a science and an art in itself. And there are so many facets of the subject. So this is just a brief introduction. I did have to cut it down. I was asked to keep it to an hour because usually it's about <laughs> 80 minutes long. 
Um, I could talk for a week. So I've just chosen some subjects I hope will interest you all, get you excited and give you a flavor of what it's all about. <clears throat> okay, so just to give you a quick overview of the talk, um, I'll be talking what I think is so great about philately. Uh, there's a, a quick slide about astronomy, what is it? Then I'll be giving you an introduction into astronomy and philately, and then the world's first astronomy stamps. And then I'll take a look at the global spread of astronomy on stamps and astronomy stamps issued in the UK. Then I will look at assembling an astronomy and space theme collection, uh, which I'm sure Margaret Morris recognises, <laughs> and um, then how to get started in collecting astronomy stamps. <clears throat> Okay, so what's so great about philately? Well, it's a really unusual and creative way of learning about history, geography, science, culture, politics, even animals, and comic books, and of course, astronomy and space. There is literally a stamp for everything. So just to give you a few examples, I'm sure you all have seen many of these stamps before. Um, we have a, a stamp here issued in Egypt in 1986, depicting hieroglyphs. Uh, in the UK in 2001, the Royal Mail issued a set of four stamps celebrating the British weather. And there are even stamps with a dinosaur theme, which is a really interesting branch of thematic philately called paleo philately. And we have a stamp here issued in Switzerland celebrating chemistry. And again, another fascinating branch of thematic philately called chemo philately. And a set of four stamps here issued in 2019 celebrating hip hop culture in the US. And I found this quote on the internet, which I thought summed up the hobby really well. Um, stamp collecting is so much more than a hobby, it's a lifestyle, a community, and it is a lifestyle for me now, you know, writing about it and studying and the community that I'm part of online is brilliant and I've made some fantastic connections. And I think the hobby is really enjoying a boom right now, and thanks to social uh, media, you know, it's kind of becoming really popular amongst younger people again, thanks to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, for example. So just to give you an example of some of these guys out there on, on uh, social media, on the left here we have the Punk Philatelist, he has a blog about stamps and he believes that, the, um, that they are a vibrant expression of pop culture. And this chap here in the middle, Graham Beck, um, he has his own YouTube <coughs> channel called Exploring Stamps and he's exploring the world one stamp at a time. And my friend here, John Simper, he has his own kind of um, monthly subscription on Patreon, I think it's called, um, where you can su subscribe to different uh, tiers and he will send you a monthly kind of package every month, depending how much you're paying, and he can send you stamps and first day covers and whatnot. And uh, yeah, you know, it, it's a real kind of fantastic way to escape and unplug from the real world. And for me, it's a way to research and learn subjects. And I love to promote both disciplines. Okay, so just a, a quick slide on astronomy. What is it? Well, it's the, um, it's the branch of science which deals with celestial objects, space, and the physical universe as a whole. And I'm sure that when we've all looked at the night sky, we've, you know, we've viewed constellations, planets, and comets with the naked eye. And many of you may have a telescope and observe galaxies and nebula. <clears throat> Mass, physics, and chemistry are used to explain their origins, for example, orbits of the planets, star formation, and the composition of nebula, which are composed of dust, hydrogen, and helium. And astronomy dates back to the Babylonians, the Greeks, and observers in the Middle East and China. And I'll touch briefly on this later. So professional astronomy is split into observational and theoretical branches. And observational astronomy is focused on acquiring data from observations of astronomical objects. And the main source of information about these celestial bodies and other objects is visible light, or more generally, the electromagnetic radiation. And theoretical astronomy is orientated towards the development of computer or analytical models to describe astronomical objects and phenomena, and these two fields then complement each other. So theoretical astronomy seeks to explain observational results, and observations are used to confirm theoretical results. And of course, we have cosmology, <coughs> which is a separate branch of astronomy, and again, has appeared on stamps. It is a scientific study of the origin, evolution, and eventual fate of the universe. Okay, so astronomy and philately. Well, philately is a great way to learn about astronomy and other branches of the subject through postal history, cancellations, the stamps and covers. And it's also the collection, appreciation, and research activities on stamps and other, phil and other philatelic products, such as Cinderella stamps, poster stamps, space mail, 
astrophilately, which is called astrophilately, sorry. And this can tell us a lot about astronomy, the history of spaceflight, astronauts, animals in space, black holes, the list is endless. So Cinderella stamps, I'm sure you've all heard of these. Um, these are virtually anything resembling a postage stamp, but they haven't been issued for postal purposes by government postal administration. For example, scout post stamps. <clears throat> I just wanted to show these two examples of space themed Cinderella stamps. So the, this um, image here on the left, this is the solar system rocket service stamps, really interesting Cinderella issue and um, produced by Broadway approvals who were based in Denmark Hill, London. And they advertised in boys comics from 1955 till the 1970s. And you may notice or not because the, the image might, might not be quite um, large enough, but the perforations aren't actually perforations at all. They're just tiny little ink dots. And this little stamp here on the right hand side, um, on May 5th, 1961, NASA Project Mercury astronaut Alan Shepard aboard his Freedom 7 capsule powered by a Redstone booster became the first American in space and his suborbital flight lasted 15 minutes and 28 seconds. And this, station, this stamp was issued by AMVETS or the American veterans to celebrate this event. <clears throat> And this is a great example of an astronomical error. Thanks to Margaret for providing this image. Um, it's a stamp issued in Czechoslovakia in 1967. And you can see here the image has been blown up from the little box on the left hand side. And the engraver of the stamp has mixed up two letters of the alphabet so that constellations Lapis and Lupus are transposed. And with the growing celebration of um, space and astronomy through philately, some covers made it beyond our atmosphere into space aboard shuttles or Apollo missions. And the Apollo 15 postal cover incident, for example, is notorious. And known to NASA, the crew of Apollo 15, Al Warden, David Oscott, and James B. Irwin agreed to carry 400 unauthorized postmark covers aboard the spacecraft and subsequently onto the surface of the moon. <clears throat> and upon the astronauts' return, the covers were postmarked again aboard the recovery ship Okinawa. And Hermann Seeger, the German stamp dealer involved in the plan, sold some of the covers for prices in the thousands. And when news of the flown covers reached NASA, the astronauts were reprimanded and forbidden to fly in space ever again. So if you ever see this on eBay or at a local auction for a couple of quid, buy it because it's worth quite a lot of money. And I thought this was quite interesting recently. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure you will know that the one cent magenta was uh, bought by Stanley Gibbons back in June. And I contacted Sotheby's in New York to ask for a catalog. Um, of the auction because you know I thought gosh when am I gonna kind of ever see the stamp being auctioned off again now it's you know it, it might not happen in my lifetime um and yeah when it came I was leafing through the pages and I thought this was a very interesting um page and and this comet uh, ink stamp here that you can see at the top kind of jumped out at me so it's very common for people who own the one cent magenta to sign the back of the um the stamp or mark the back of the stamp and the infrared photography was used to bring these kind of markings, you know, up so that we could see them really um, quite sharply. And yeah, and I noticed this comet stamp and it was owned by a guy um, called Frederick T. Small. He was an Australian stamp collector and he bought the stamp back in 1940. And I've been trying to get to the bottom of why he decided to mark the one cent magenta with a comet stamp because when I've researched him, uh, it's quite clear that he has no connections with astronomy. So yeah, I just thought it was kind of a really interesting um, you know, like crossover between an astronomy and philately. And if anyone knows the answer to why he chose that marking, please let me know. So we all know it's not just about stamps. Uh, it, it, you know, that's not just what collectors are interested in. Philatelists like to collect first aid covers, which is a postage stamp on a postal card or stamped envelope franked on the first day, the stamp is authorised for use. And the stamps are affixed to specially designed envelopes, often with the design of the theme that's being celebrated. And of course, we also like to collect post office headquarter cards. And some of us are really kind of focused on collecting cancellations and special hand stamps. So this is a really interesting first day cover. Um, it was issued in 2018 in Canada to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And the stamp on the left shows the Milky Way which was photographed in Bruce Peninsula Park, Ontario. 
and on the right hand side we have the northern lights which were photographed over Churchill Manitoba. One of my probably favorite covers I really love this cover it's so colorful and you know very kind of um, just a great illustration of the solar system. This was issued in 2002 by the, the Royal Mail and yes yeah, just a great example of, of a fantastic decorative first day cover and the PHQ cards um, so um, I'm sure you're familiar with these they're just postcard sized images of the stamps that have been issued and this set of five uh, that again that were issued in 2002 celebrating astronomy um, it was in the miniature sheet was included on one of those above and the hand stamps are cancellations alone of interest to some collectors and for some astronomy philatelists there's some wonderful hand stamps available and these are simply ink stamps used to cancel the stamps so they can't be reused and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes pictures and ink color and I think you know imaginative hand stamps are really eye-catching and they form an important an important part of the cover and the stamps on the covers they can be cancelled with the usual first day of issue date stamp at a post office but often people will send the covers away which I'm sure we've all done to a special hand stamp centre to have these stamps cancelled with a special pictorial design which adds to the theme of the cover and they're often stamped with a picture and the location of something or someone relevant to the stamps and sometimes you can get up to 40 pictorial cancels for one set of issue of stamps and people who collect um, mainly for the postmarks and cancellations um, they're called Markopolis and Markopolis is obviously the collection of those <coughs> um, hand stamps. So we have this really interesting pictorial hand stamp for the space science issue in 2012 and bottom right here we have this lovely 50th anniversary of man on the moon hand stamp and I really like how they substituted the zero for the astronaut's footprint um, and not all postmarks are produced to correspond with the first day issue of a stamp for example so here we have a brilliant cancellation commemorating Comet Bennett in the middle in 1970 and it's perihelion on the 20th of March 1970 and on the left there in November 2018 a postmark was produced to celebrate InSight a robotic lander landing on Mars so I think this is a really interesting example actually of when the stamp and the postmark have absolutely nothing to do with each other so the stamp you know a stamp wasn't issued to commemorate this event um, but a, a postmark was produced <clears throat> and can you sign my cover please this is something I say a lot autographs from eminent scientists and astronomer, astronomers form a really special part of my collection I have autographs ranging from Dr. Alan Chapman, Ian Ridpath, who was a chairman of the Astro Space Stamp Society, and I have Jim Al Khalili, he's a, a famous theoretical physicist. Um, most recently, um, Chris Lintott and Pete Lawrence from the Sky at Night, they kindly signed this first day cover for me, and Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And it's quite easy to get in touch with these people. I just kind of email them and say, please, will you sign this if I send you, you know, a stamp and an envelope to return it? And, and everyone's just been so nice, no one's said no yet so quite pleased about that and the cover here and um, this shows an envelope celebrating John Glenn the first American in space I'm not sure if this is an authentic handwritten signature it could be an auto pen and an auto pen is a device used for the automatic signing of a signature or autograph and they're often used when celebrities or famous people get hundreds of letters each day so yeah like when you know the, the Apollo missions got really big and the astronauts couldn't spend the time signing every single piece of kind of mail that came to them so a lot of them were signed with an auto pen and there's a really interesting website called the astronaut auto pen guide on the internet it's a really fantastic resource to check if any covers you have signed by astronauts are genuine or not okay so so all of this is great um, but what can all of these four pieces of philatelic information teach us about astronomy so if you remember you know i said it's about researching the stamps and the dates and here is an example of all, all four elements coming together. So the stamps, the postmark, signature and the cachet, which is the illustration on the left hand side of an envelope on the first day cover, it can unravel a factual account about an astronomical event such as the centenary of general relativity. So here we have the first day cover. You can see that the stamps are affixed. There's a postmark, uh, signatures and a cachet. So each stamp sh like showcases work of Einstein and Hawking. We have Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, gravitational waves, Hawking radiation, two black holes colliding, and a black hole. And a silver postmark was used to cancel the stamps on the 1st of July 2016, the, dates the, stamp the date the stamps were issued. Um, 
and the cache tells us what the stamps are celebrating. It also tells us they were launched at Starmus 2016, which is an international festival focused on celebrating astronomy. And the cover has been autographed by famous astrophysicist Professor Kip Thorne and Professor Bernard Schutz. And I was lucky enough to meet Professor Kip Thorne in October in 2019 at Electro at Cardiff University. He just opened a new physics laboratory at the university and he delivered a talk. And Bernard Schutz was there too. And I just recently interviewed Bernard actually for the Royal Astronomical Society magazine. Um, and yeah, and Kip Thorne was Bernard Schutz's um, supervisor when Bernard was doing his PhD. So it's really nice that, you know, they've kept in touch all these years and it was great to meet them both together and get them to sign my cover. So I think this is just a really great example of what philately can teach someone about astronomy. For example, if I was to pass this cover to someone who knew little about general relativity or cosmology, they could take this away and do hours of research looking at the details on the stamps. You know, who are these people? What's general relativity? Um, what's Starmus? What's a black hole? So yeah, you could just be sent down a, a rabbit hole really of uh, looking up all the information on a first day cover. And I just wanted to focus in on these stamps because I think they're absolutely fantastic and they're just so beautifully produced. Um, so these images are printed on iridescent foil, which really makes them unique and eye-catching. And I had great fun researching these because my knowledge of cosmology isn't great. So it's really interesting to delve deep to find out what the words and even the diagrams meant. So here we have Albert Einstein and his famous um, uh, ah, forgotten it. <laughs> equation of um, special relativity. We have uh, Stephen Hawking here and the famous Birkenstein Hawking equation. And on the right, we have the famous trousers diagram representing two black holes colliding. The bottom left here, we have Hawking radiation. And this diagram was actually based on a blackboard sketch, which was sent to the designers of the stamps from Cambridge University. So that's really interesting. Uh, we have an image of a black hole here. And here we have a, an image of gravitational waves. Okay, so you might all be wondering, well, where did it all start? What was the world's first astronomy stamp? Well, the world's first astronomy themed stamp was issued in Brazil in 1887. Um, it issued a perforated stamp, buff and blue in color, depicting Crux Australis, which is the Southern Cross and asterism of the constellation Crux seen in the Southern Hemisphere. And here it is. And the asterism is astronomically accurate on the stamp with Acrux and Gacrux pointing the way to the South Celestial Pole. And it's illustrated as if the observer were looking up to the sky from Earth. And stars are really, you know, they're a really symbolic part of the Brazilian flag. They represent the constellations in the Southern Hemisphere. And they show how they were seen from Rio de Janeiro during the early hours of the morning of the 15th of November, 1889, the day the country shifted from an empire to a republic. So you can see that the Southern Cross constellation is a really important part of their history and culture. So it's understandable that it would really, you know, it would feature heavily on stamps. And as you will see over the next few slides, the Southern Cross was a favorite to print on Brazilian stamps for almost 10 years with the color and size of the stamp evolving over that time. So the world's second astronomy stamp, well, that was issued in Brazil again. Um, three years later, in 1890, uh, they issued a further series of perforated postage stamps featuring the Southern Cross, this time in a variety of colours and values, which you can see here top right. And then the asterism featured for a second time in 1890, but this time on perforated newspaper stamps. So stamp these are stamps that were used to pay for the cost of mailing newspapers or periodicals. And for this design, the asterism was illustrated shining above the Sugarloaf Mountain, Brazil's world famous landmark. So you might just be able to make out the asterism here. I don't know if you can see my pointer actually. Um, it's just in the circle between, between the words and then just under the letter A of journeys, if that's how you pronounce it, um, you can just see the, uh, the sugar loaf there. And then these stamps were issued uh, again in 1898 when Brazil, well, they reissued the stamps as newspaper surcharge stamps and they were overprinted with the year and stamp value and the term surcharge in philately describes any type of overprint that alters the price of a stamp. And surcharges raise or lower the face value of existing stamps when prices have changed too quickly to produce an appropriate new issue or simply to use up surplus stocks. So you can see that here, bottom right, the, uh, the overprint there, the date. And the star appears. So Venus the Morning Star appeared on a set of stamps issued in Brazil in 1894 and is the first stamp featuring a planet and these stamps are known as Madrugada Republicana, 
the Republican dawn, and they commemorate the beginning of the Republican period. As I mentioned earlier, on the 15th of November, 1889, a group of military officers known as Republican Dawn overthrew Emperor Dom Pedro II with the fall of the monarchy taking place around 8 a.m. that day. And research of astronomical charts has shown that Venus was visible in the morning sky at the time of the fall of the monarchy, affirming that the bright star on the stamp is undoubtedly Venus. So the Southern Cross in reverse. Well, jumping ahead to the 20th of June, 1930, the fourth Pan-American Congress of Architects was held in Rio de Janeiro and to commemorate this event, three stamps were issued, including the 300 wreath stamp illustrating the Southern Cross above the sugar loaf with the addition of two columns or architrave in the foreground. And if you compare this image um, to the previous stamps that have been issued, you will notice that the asterism is a mirror image of its true self. Well, why was this? Well, the mirror image of the asterism on the 1930 stamp was perhaps illustrated as if the observer were looking down on the celestial sphere um, from, from above, as sailors and astronomers would have done when using an armillary sphere or astrolabe for navigation. And if you're unfamiliar with an armillary sphere, then here's one on a stamp um, that was issued in Nicaragua, I can't say it, Nicaragua in 1985, celebrating the return of Halley's Comet. And after all, the Southern Cross is depicted in reverse on the flag, and an astrolabe features on the Empire of Brazil flag again tying in with Brazil's nautical history. I'm not entirely sure why the illustration of the Southern Cross was changed at this particular time on the stamp. And again, if anyone knows, please let me know. So the astronomical theme slowly spread to other countries. In 1930, Italy issued a stamp depicting aeroplanes and the Southern Cross, which you can see quite clearly. In 1941, Norway issued a stamp depicting fishing boats with the Aurora in the background. And the 50th anniversary of the Mizuzawa Latitude Observatory featured on a stamp issued in Japan in 1949. Ecuador issue, issued a stamp in 1949 um, depict, illustrating the Equatorial Line Monument marking the position of the equator. And in 2009, San Marino um, issued a stamp celebrating International Year of Astronomy. And in 1970, Poland issued a stamp celebrating space exploration. And in 1981, the USA celebrated or issued a stamp um, illustrating the Hubble Space Telescope. I'll just have a drink. So while countries over the world, from Colombia to Nigeria, Japan and Russia, they celebrated astronomy and humankind's achievement in space, the UK did not start commemorating astronomy in space until much later. In 1966, the Royal Mail issued a stamp depicting a radio telescope at Jodrell Brank. It's bright yellow in colour, costs four pennies, and the stamp was issued within a set of four, and each image celebrated a different aspect of British technology. And then in 1970, the Royal Mail issued a stamp commemorating the 150th anniversary of the Royal Astronomical Society. It was issued within a set of five stamps celebrating anniversaries in the UK. The pink in colour, the stamp depicts William Herschel, holding a sketch of Uranus, which he discovered in 1781, and he was the first president of the Royal Astronomical Society. In the middle there, we've got Francis Bailey. Um, Bailey's beads are named after Francis Bailey, and these are an arc of bright spots um, that, that are seen during a total or annual eclipse. And on the end there, we have John Herschel, um, William Herschel's son, and he is famous for many things, including um, naming seven moons of Jupiter. And on the right here, we have Herschel's 40-foot telescope, which was built in Slough between 1785 and 1789. So again, you know, small stamp, but you can glean a lot of information from it. So, you know, who are they? What's Herschel holding? What's the Royal Astronomical Society? How on earth do you build a 40-foot telescope? So yeah, a, a great example of, of learning about astronomy from philately. So I've chosen five examples of astronomy stamps issued in the UK over recent years. In 2002, the Royal Mail issued a miniature sheet of stamps celebrating British astronomy. You saw those earlier. So whilst the pictures are very attractive, unfortunately, there seems to be a lack of connection to British astronomy and astronomers because all the images here were taken using the Hubble Space Telescope. And in 1768, James Cook, he boarded the ship Endeavour in Plymouth, England and sailed to Tahiti. The trip took around eight months and the purpose of this trip was to view the transit of Venus 
with the aim to gather astronomical information to measure the solar system. And the Royal Mail issued a set of six stamps on August 2018 to commemorate the 250th anniversary of the voyage. Uh, James Cook and Charles Green made drawings during their observations of the transit, and these have been used on a first class stamp called the Endeavour Voyage, which you can see here. And they've been superimposed onto an image of the sun. And one of the most interesting details of the drawings is the black drop effect that, that they observed during the transit, which you can clearly see on the stamp um, just about there. And the stamp is also illustrated with a sextant, which was used for navigation purposes during the voyage. And one of the Millennium Projects commemorated on stamps was the National Space Centre at Leicester. The centre, which has a particularly distinctive space age building, was not finished at the time the stamp was released in 2000, so could not be illustrated, unfortunately, so the Royal Mail had to make do with a generic picture of the night sky. And in 1987, the UK's Royal Mail again reissued four stamps marking the 300th anniversary of Isaac Newton's Principia, and despite the small size, the stamps are bursting with information about Newton's accomplishments. So the 34 pen stamp, for example, bottom right, portrays a satellite along with Newton's insights on projectile motion and orbits. And the 22 pen stamp, uh, top right, honours his study of planetary motion through the depiction of six planets orbiting the sun, on top of which is an impressive coronal loop. And the 50th anniversary of Patrick Moore's BBC TV programme, The Sky at Night, was commemorated by a set of six colourful and attractive stamps released in 2007. The designs show, for example, the Cat's Eye Nebula, the Saturn Nebula, and the Helix Nebula, and superimposed on each image is an outline of the home constellation with the location of the object marked, and all objects are identified with a number beginning with the letter C, which is their reference in Patrick's own brand, Caldwell Catalogue, his full name, his full surname being Caldwell Moore. And just a quickie, another piece of um, very interesting information I found out recently, in this paper here called Adjusting Object Glasses of Refracting Telescopes. While German telescope makers have used postage stamps to actually separate the objective lenses and apochromatic telescopes, so using stamps sometimes replace the need to use a mucilage on paper or tin foil because obviously the stamp was already gummed. And yeah, and I just thought this was a really unusual example of philately and astronomy. Quite interesting, so I'm excited to read more about that if I can. Okay, so assembling an astronomy and philately collection. Well, you've probably already noticed that, you know, I've covered everything from astronomers to telescopes to constellations. They've all appeared on stamps and I've kind of given you a real mishmash of examples. And as you all know, there isn't much point in collecting stamps if you aren't going to learn something from them. That's why I love collecting stamps with an astronomy theme so much. Margaret Morris, um, back in 2013, she published a paper called Astronomy and Philately, where Margaret discussed the two subjects. And she grouped her collections into three main groups. And I think this is a really useful way of organizing um, a philately collection within the subjects of astronomy. So I'm just going to give you a few of my own examples under each section to illustrate what subjects we can learn in astronomy from philately in an organized and logical way. So we'll be looking at the observers. So I'll be using examples of astronomers, an astronomical anniversary, such as the Royal Astronomical Society. Then we'll be looking at the observables. So I've chosen our solar system and everyone's favourite um, in the astronomy world, comets. And the observations. So, you know, what, what were the instruments that people were using to make these observations? I've actually added my own fourth title. Um, because Margaret didn't mention it in her paper, but also because I think it's probably classed as astrophilately, so a kind of separate subject. But I didn't want to leave it out, so it's a topic we all know and love, um, and that's the explorers, so I'll just be looking at human exploration and achievements, so the space race and moon landing on stamps. Okay, so the observers. So we all know that astronomy is one of the oldest natural sciences, and this subject has been celebrated on stamps all over the world. Astronomy dates back to the fourth millennium BC and Babylonian astronomers were skilled observers and mathematicians and they studied the sky and devoted their time to studying the planetary movements and adopted the use of the zodiacal belt. And they also recorded observations of comets and eclipses and these studies were recorded on cuneiform clay tablets. And this stamp here from Austria issued in 1965 depicts a cuneiform clay tablet and these tablets show a really good understanding of arithmetic, algebra, and geometry. And the Egyptians, 
By the third millennium BC, Egyptians had already adopted a 365 day year and annual flooding of the Nile was determined observing the stars. And the stamp here on the right hand side depicts Hathor. It was issued in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1964. And according to ancient myths, Hathor was a sky goddess known as Lady of Stars and Sovereign of Stars and linked to Sirius. And she was originally a personification of the Milky Way, which is considered to be the milk that flowed from the udders of a heavenly cow. And the Chinese, you know, they've had a really long history of astronomy dating back to the second millennium BC. And in a second century tomb, a silk roll was found which depicts comets and is considered the first atlas of comets. And the stamp here on the left hand side was issued in China in 1986 and commemorates the return of Halley's Comet. And you can see the images on the stamp echo the images that feature on the scroll. So yeah, so observations of celestial bodies and scientific discoveries have shaped our way of thinking about our place in universe. So jumping ahead from the ancient observers to the scientists and astronomers who changed our view of our place in universe over the last few centuries. Here we have Copernicus. He was a popular astronomer, astronomer to feature on stamps. He is from Poland and he proposed that the planets have the sun as the fixed point to which their motions are to be referred. And he's featured on a stamp here issued in Poland in 1942. And here he is again, uh, featuring on a stamp issued in Hungary in 1973 to commemorate 500 years since his birth. And the stamp here on the left is a really great example of a Cinderella stamp. Tycho Brahe, he was a Danish nobleman, astronomer and writer known for his accurate and comprehensive astronomical observations. He was a real character. In fact, he had a false nose made of brass, which had been cut off during a sword fight. He formed his own system, the Tychonic system, and his system correctly saw the moon as orbiting Earth and the planets as orbiting the sun, but erroneously considered the sun to be orbiting the Earth. Johannes Kepler was Tycho's assistant. Kepler was a convinced Copernican and considered Tycho's model to be mistaken. He is also, of course, famous for his laws of planetary motion, and he was commemor commemorated on a stamp in the Czech Republic in 2009. And the father of astronomy, Galileo, he was an astronomer, engineer and physicist, and he is famous for his use of the telescope and making celestial observations. He observed the phases of Venus and the four largest satellites of Jupiter. And whilst he wasn't the first person to observe the moon, he made topographical charts estimating the heights of the mountains and he was celebrated on a stamp issued in Ascension in 1971. And last but not least, Sir Isaac Newton. He's recognised as one of the greatest mathematicians and scientists of all time. Born in England, Newton formulated the laws of motion and made seminal contributions to optics. And he was celebrated on a postage stamp in 1987 in Grenada. And he's, here he is illustrated holding the apple that was said to give him as inspiration to formulate the theory of gravity. So to continue with the observer's theme, um, on, the, the, on February 11th, 2020, the Royal Mail, um, oops, sorry, I missed the, the beginning bit there, um, but we've saw this before, it's a commemorative stamp issued in 1970, celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Royal Astronomical Society. Last year, the Royal Mail issued a set of stamps to commemorate the bicentenary of the Royal Astronomical Society. The Society was formed in 1820 at a tavern in London and the Society has now grown to 4,000 members and is one of the most eminent societies in the world promoting astronomy and geophysics. So this issue you can see here is called Visions of the Universe and has eight stamps in total illustrating astronomical phenomena such as Comet 67P, the Cat's Eye Nebula, we have pulsars, Jupiter's auroras, gravitational lensing and black holes. And each stamp includes one simple line of text that describes phenomena which has been discovered or investigated by British astronomers and astrophysicists. So for example, on the left there in the middle, uh, the, the first class black hole stamp displays a text, black holes are super dense regions of space. And this is a nod to the English natural philosopher, John Mitchell, who first suggested their existence in 1783 and the late famous British professor and theoretical physicist, Stephen Hawking, who made predictions about their behaviors. Um, and the stamp set was illustrated by a London based artist called Robert Ball. You know, I think you'll agree the stamps are really colourful in hues of blue and red, and they really bring to life the amazing phenomena in a way that photographs could not. And in particular, going back to the black hole stamp again, this is based on the work of Dr. Ziri Yunzi of University College London. 
and he was part of the Event Horizon Telescope team that captured the groundbreaking, groundbreaking first image of a black hole in 2019. And he shared computer models of his work on black holes with Robert Ball, the illustrator of the stamps, to inform the stamps design. So I think these stamps are a really fitting celebration for the bicentenary of such a prestigious um, society and the contributions of British scientists to research in this field. Okay, so what have the observers been looking at? Well, our solar system is home to the sun, eight planets and fascinating astronomical objects, including comets, asteroids and dwarf planets such as Pluto. And on the 16th of October 2012, the Royal Mail celebrated the 50th anniversary of the first British satellite Ariel 1. And images of our incredible solar system featured on six detailed stamps. And using imagery taken from various pro probes, the colour and imagination were brought to life, giving us armchair astronomers a close-up view of these mysterious worlds. And again, each image has a relationship with the UK's involvement in astronomy. So the sun, for example, featuring on the first class stamp here, the, the fiery orange image was photographed by the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, which was a joint pr project between the European Space Agency and NASA. And the spacecraft actually continues to make observation um, observations of the sun's chromosphere, atmosphere and corona, despite it initially only being a two-year mission. And planets featuring on the stamp set include Venus and Mars, in, they're both um, the Earth's nearest neighbours, and the images chosen on the first class and 77 pen stamps are examples of how beautiful our fellow rocky planets are. And the exploration of Venus and Mars have strong UK connections. So the Venus Express mission was proposed by scientists at Oxford University, and the image taken by ESA's Mars Express probe was the first European mission to Mars, with the UK having involvement in three of the six onboard instruments. And the Earth featured on its own stamp in 1984, when the Royal Mail commemorated the 100 year anniversary of the adoption of the Greenwich Meridian, the world's prime meridian. The image chosen on this 16 pen stamp is that of Earth as seen from Apollo 11, with a curved red line of zero longitude superimposed on top. And I'm sure many of us remember the total solar eclipse in 1999. Seven stamps were issued um, in that year by the Guernsey Post Office to commemorate the eclipse. And these are a fantastic set taking the collector through the five stages of the eclipse, including the first and second contact, totality, and you can see Bailey's beads on the images and the diamond ring effect. Six stamps hold a value and can be used for postage, whilst the seventh is a Cinderella stamp. Comets, everyone's favourite. So comets have been the cause of fascination and fear for centuries, originating from the cold, dark outer reaches of the solar system. They're composed of ice and rock, and you can see two comets featuring here on an Indian, uh, a mini sheet issued in India in 2018. And comets originate from two locations, the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. Comets originating from the Kuiper Belt are short period comets and can orbit the sun in less than 200 years, whereas comets originating from the Oort Cloud take much longer to orbit the sun, often thousands of years, and these are known as long period comets. So we have this fantastic shaped um, comet theme stamp here issued in Finland in 2014 as part of the Signs in the Sky issue. And we have two comet stamps here issued in Congo in 1986, um, illustrating comet Ikea Seki, which was seen in 1965, and we have Comet West, uh, which was seen in 1976. How these comets? Um, named after the famous astronomer Edmund Halley, or Hawley, however you want to pronounce his name, I say Halley. Um, Halley's Comet is perhaps the most famous short period comet in our history due to its return period of 67 years. Some of us may even see it twice in our lifetime. And the comet has been recorded as far back as 240 BC in China and was embroidered into the world famous Bayou Tapestry. And a souvenir stamp sheet issued in Bolivia in 1986 features scene 32 from the Bayou Tapestry and the comet can clearly be seen on the upper border. So the appearance of Halley's Comet in 1985 was celebrated globally on stamps. Here in the UK and the Royal Mail issued a fantastic set of four stamps in 1986, which were illustrated by the famous cartoonist Ralph Steadman. The stamps are colourful and imaginative. They depict a rather disgruntled, a bit comical looking Halley down there on the bottom right. Uh, we have an image of two comets representing seeing it twice in a lifetime on the left. And we have Giotto, the spacecraft, um, top right. 
and the comet orbiting the sun. And a set of first day covers that I really enjoy collecting are those that were issued by the presentation for the Telex services in London between from what I think is 1984 to 1995. And the card inlay within each cover explains that each issue depicts a fine art painting or other collectible auctioned by Sotheby's of London. So for example, the first day cover that you see here, you can see it's got the, the four Halley's Comet stamps on them. Um, it's on the left hand side there was a beautiful silk cachet of a portable refracting telescope manufactured by Peter Dolland and he was a well-known maker of optical instruments and the telescope was actually sold by Sotheby's at auction in 1985 for £22,000. And it's 26 years this year that Hale-Bopp was discovered. It moved across our skies for approximately 18 months. Um, Hale-Bopp was the mo one of the most observed comets. It's been Trump now. Um, with the 20th century, it was discovered independently by Alan Hale and Thomas Bopp um, in the US on the 23rd of July, 1995. And the comet passed perihelion, which was its closest approach to Earth on the 1st of April 1997. As far as I'm aware, there's very few stamps um, out there that were issued to celebrate this exciting event. But on the 1st of April 1997, the Dominican Republic issued a set of stamps depicting the comet positioned against a tropical pink and yellow sky. And you can clearly see um, it's two tails of gas and dust in both images. And in my cover, in my collection, I have a custom cover commemorating the comet. It was sent to me by a former NASA employee who specializes in making his own covers. The cover is postmarked at Cloudcroft, New Mexico on the 24th of March, 1997, which was two days after the comet made its closest approach to Earth. And Cloudcroft is the location where Alan Hale first made the discovery. And the image on the cover there illustrates the position of the comet in the night sky from the date of its discovery to the date it was last observed in the Southern Hemisphere. And for those keen astronomers amongst us, Comet Neowise would not have passed you by last year. It was first discovered on March 27th, 2020 by the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer and the comet's closest approach to Earth was on the 23rd of July last year. And the comet could easily be seen with the naked eye, even in urban areas, and it is now known as one of the brightest comets since the appearance of Hillbop in 1997. And Sark in Guernsey, that was designated a dark sky island in 2011. And the 10 year anniversary is celebrated this year and they produced a set of six stamps uh, which were issued back in June I think um, commemorating the anniversary and included this lovely stamp featuring Comet Neowise. Okay so the observations, um, the tools of the observers, how were people observing? So for thousands of years our ancestors looked to the sky, they observed and named the stars and constellations after animals, objects and mythological characters. And they would worship the solstices and watch the planets traversing across the sky. And all of these early attempts at recording and understanding the sky have been found on the design of stamps. So the prehistoric monument of Stonehenge in Wiltshire has long been studied for its possible connections with ancient astronomy. The site is aligned in the direction of the sunrise of the summer solstice and the sunset of the winter solstice. And archaeo astronomers have made a range of further claims about the site's connection to astronomy, its meaning and its use. And it has appeared twice on stamps issues in the UK, once in 1990 on the left there, celebrating the subject of astronomy. You can see just the left of the image, um, a gyroscope, and on the right hand side, there's a ship there navigating by the stars. And it appeared again in 2005 on a stamp celebrating World Heritage Sites. And the Nebra Sky Disc, this is a bronze disc, it's blue and golden colour. It's quite small, it's only about 30 centimetres in diameter. It was found in Germany in 1999 by metal detectorists and the symbols on the disc were interpreted generally as a sun, a full moon, a lunar crescent and stars which include a cluster of seven stars interpreted as the Pleiades and two golden arcs along the sides interpreted to mark the angle between the solstices were probably added later. And a final addition was another arc at the bottom surrounded by multiple strokes of uncertain meaning variously interpreted as a solar barge with numerous oars the Milky Way or even a rainbow. An archaeologist placed the origins of the disc in the first millennium BCE and the disc may have been an ast astronomical instrument and it featured on a postage stamp in Germany in 2008 celebrating German archaeology. Other astronomical instruments that have been attributed to watching and recording our skies include the astrolabe, an armillary sphere, 
but perhaps the most of all is the telescope, which you can see here on a stamp, which was um, issued in Sierra Leone, commemorating the 450th anniversary of Copernicus's death. So observatories, telescopes are often housed in observatories. In 1921, the first stamp depicting an observatory was issued in central Lithuania. It's produced in two forms, perforate and imperforate, and the image on the stamp displays the Poxabut Observatory, named after the astronomer Marcin Poxabut, famous for his observational work and for computing the orbit of Mercury. <clears throat> and the observatory theme continued in 1948. The United States printed their first astronomy theme three cent stamp with an image of Palomar Mountain Observatory, and the stamp was issued to commemorate the observatory's opening. The observatory houses the Hale Telescope, a 200 inch telescope named after George Hale, a famous American solar astronomer well known for his work on the discovery of magnetic fields in sunspots. And the Reflecting Telescope was the largest at the time. It launched new developments in telescope design, including its mount and mirror. And the fourth section, the final section, the explorers. <clears throat> from July 1957 to December 1958, scientists from 67 countries participated in various earth science projects as part of the International Geophysical Year. And to mark this occasion, the US Post Office issued a stamp featuring a striking illustration of the sun, which was in the most active phase of its 11 year cycle, solar cycle 19, which is the 19th solar cycle since 1755. And also depicted is a section of Michelangelo's famous Sistine Chapel painting, The Creation of Adam, which is a nod to our natural curiosity and desire to understand our place in the universe. So the IG, sorry, the International Geophysical Year came at a time when the Soviet Union and the US were locked in a heated race to be the first nation to go to space. And the Soviet Union succeeded on the 4th of October 1957. Sputnik 1 was the first artificial satellite launched into low Earth orbit and the satellite survived just under three months in space before falling back to Earth and burning up in our atmosphere. And the Soviet Union issued its first Sputnik stamp on the 4th of November 1957, which you can see there bottom left. The 40 kopeck perforated stamp was a simple design, blue and grey in colour, and illustrates the satellite orbiting the Earth. And the launch of Sputnik has been celebrated globally on stamps including Romania, Cuba and Korea. And after the successful launch of Laika, the space dog, aboard Sputnik 2 on the 3rd of November 1957, there she is there, a further triumph came for the USSR in 1961 when Yuri Gagarin was launched aboard Vostok 1 and orbited the Earth for 108 minutes before he returned to Earth. And he was the first man in space and the first man to orbit the Earth. And not one to shy away from celebrating their achievements through philately, a plethora of stamps from the Soviet Union commemorating this momentous event exists, including this rather wonderful 10 kopeck stamp, a great example of Soviet space propaganda, illustrating Gagarin looking to the stars as Vostok 1 shoots off into the sky above a silhouetted skyline and the date of the launch in the rocket's wake. So whilst the Soviet Union blazed a trail into space, the USA was successful in their own first, and on the 20th of July 1969, the crew of Apollo 11 were the first to land on the moon in their lunar module, the Eagle, and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped onto the moon's surface on the 21st of July 1969. Needless to say, there was an explosion in the issue of stamps and memorabilia celebrating this milestone, and this single 10 cent stamp here, top left, was issued in September 1969, designed by Paul Calais. It was issued to celebrate this historic visit to our celestial neighbour and it illustrates Neil Armstrong setting foot on the moon, embarking from Eagle, the lunar landing. And the engraving plates actually for the postage stamp were carried to the surface of the moon by the Apollo 11 astronauts and it now resides in the National Postal Museum in Washington DC. And you might be wondering who Paul Kelly is. Well, he was one of the first eight artists chosen by NASA in 1962 to document the American Space Program's Project Mercury. In a space art career spanning more than 40 years, Kelly has covered Mercury, Gemini, Apollo and Space Shuttle missions. And Paul was actually the only artist present with the Apollo 11 crew of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins on the morning um, that they prepared to, to launch to the moon. And in 1989, the 20th anniversary of the moon landing, the Postal Service asked Paul's son Chris to design the $2.40 priority mail stamp and Paul to design a first day cover. 
for the for this issue and I'm lucky enough to actually have um, the, the cover um, signed by Chris and Paul so that makes a really kind of special addition to my collection and in 1994 for the 25th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing Paul and Chris jointly designed two US stamps commemorating the event so we have on the right hand side a 29 cents commemorative stamp and a $9.95 express mail stamp just on the left there. So the past couple of years have been no exception to the issue of Apollo 11 stamps and to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. The United States Postal Service issued two vertical forever stamps on the 20th of July 2019. A simple design, the images depict the iconic photograph of Buzz Aldrin taken by Neil Armstrong uh, on the left there and on the right you can see the Apollo 11 landing site on the moon and the sea of tranquility is marked with a dot. Even the Isle of Man post office kept the Apollo theme going in 2019 with some beautiful stamps. They released a set of eight fantastic stamps to commemorate the 50th anniversary of moon, man landing on the moon. The One Small Step explores 50 years of lunar exploration and tells the story of the first 12 Apollo missions. And they depict famous images, including mission control at NASA, Earthwise taken by William Anders during the Apollo 8 mission and the first footprints on the moon. And I just love the detail of these stamps around the perforations of famous quotes from people involved in the missions, including President Kenny, Kennedy and the astronauts from each mission. And each stamp features the map coordinates of a place relating to the theme of each stamp. So, for example, here on the Project Apollo stamp, um, it displays the coordinates of the Rice Stadium on the bottom left where Kennedy delivered his speech announcing the Apollo program in 1962. And just on the right hand side there, you can see Kennedy's um, famous words, we choose to go to the moon in this decade. OK, so last slide. Um, how do you get started in collecting astronomy stamps? Well, research on the Internet is probably the, the easiest and cheapest thing to do. Uh, check out auction websites such as eBay, Del Camp, Colnect, very easy to search, just type in astronomy um, or space or comets. Um, and of course, astronomy stamp societies and collectors. I probably, well, I don't know what I'd do without, you know, the support I've had from the guys at the Astro Space Stamp Society, um, the American Philatelic Society, the American Topical Association. The list is endless, but yeah, even Stanley Gibbons, you know, I've written for them and um, I have my own weekly column in the All About, on the All About Stamps website. So, it was a real, like I said at the beginning, a real community of people who will jump at the chance to help you and, and get you going. And yeah, check out books, catalogues, magazines. These books here, bottom right, are absolutely fantastic. We've got The Race to the Moon by Umberto Cavallaro and Stamping Through Astronomy by Renato Ducati. And again, these two guys are very helpful um, in my mission to, um, you know, spread the word about astronomy and philately. And thank you very much for listening. I hope you're all still there. <laughs> and to uh, to close uh, the meeting for those of us uh, remaining at this uh, hour, this is the uh, launch of the uh, European Space Agency's uh, Euclid mission on uh, one of uh, SpaceX's Falcon 9 uh, rockets uh, recently from Cape Canaveral. So uh, interesting that uh, ESA is launching from uh, America. Um, there's quite a few interesting things to notice in this uh, video. One, uh, you'll see cameras on board the rocket as it ascends. One's on the first stage of the rocket. Another camera, or in fact two cameras, are on stage two. And on top of stage two is the payload, and the payload has a fairing over it. Um, you'll see the timeline shown on the side of the video. Uh, you'll notice that the rocket starts to turn horizontal as it lifts off. And notice the pattern of the exhaust coming from the rocket. That gives you an idea of the, um, number one, the point of throttle up, and also uh, the aerodynamic uh, forces actually acting on uh, the rocket as it uh, rises. Now, as a rocket uh, lifts off, it goes through what's known as max Q. And max Q is the point of maximum pressure aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle going up. So it's the point where if something's going to go wrong due to the stress, it will occur at max Q. Um, so for example, when the space shuttle uh, blew up uh, um, many, many years ago, that was just after the point of max Q, whereby they throttle up. So when a rocket lifts off, it typically lifts off only at about two thirds power. 
until it gets past max Q that they throttle up to full power. Right, and that occurs mostly. Uh, and that's because on the ground, the aerodynamic pressure is, is basically the, uh, the speed times the pressure. And uh, while the rocket's sitting on the launch pad, the, uh, the speed is zero and the, pre and the pressure is atmospheric pressure. So zero times the atmospheric pressure is zero. And when it's up in space, there's no pressure, so that's zero, but the, the uh, speed is very, very high. So you get zero again if you multiply those two together. Uh, but in between, it goes through a parabola shape. And at the top of that parabola is this point of max Q. And you'll notice um, the exhaust uh, fans out in like a, a flower shape as it just passes through max Q, as the air is getting thinner and the, uh, the speed is uh, picking up. Uh, Miko is main engine cutoff, and um, the second stage thrusters actually fire twice. They fire the rocket once, shut the uh, the rocket engine down, and they uh, fire it up again at uh, SES two. Uh, there's a bit of interference with the telemetry you'll see in the video. It only goes for about two or three minutes, and uh, you'll notice at the end the uh, flight operations director of uh, the launch uh, is also a she. And uh, at the end, uh, she, uh, she um, de demonstrates her, her feeling of a successful launch, which I'll show you. So uh, I've put it to um, uh, a music uh, called uh, Liberty um, by um, a uh, composer group called uh, MOKKA. It goes for about two or three minutes. Thumbs up from the flight director at the end, a one successful launch. 
And with that, we'll close the uh, July meeting and we'll see you uh, hopefully uh, next month at uh, August meeting. Thank you very much.